Um, welcome everyone. My name is Blair Chintella. Uh, I'm an attorney. I, I've lived here in George for about 10 years and I practice, I practice in a variety of areas of law, um, but my hobby is First Amendment and constitutional issues. Um, and I've studied the issues a lot in my free time, probably more time than I've spent studying the law <laughs> for my practice. Um, and I got involved in this uh, Dragon Con with uh, Andrew here. He introduced me about six years ago when we were uh, debating these copyright troll cases, if any of you remember those. And they were going on around cr across the country. Um, but we're here today to talk about Donald Trump and how he's had an impact on the press, for better or for worse. And uh, I'll just introduce our panelists real quick, and then they can say a word about themselves, and we'll just get started. Um, down the far end is TJ Myhill. Uh, he is an attorney, also, he also practices in this area, and uh, he's part of the resistance uh, against anything fascist, I would say, or anything. Uh, <laughs> he, he's been here speaking on these very important issues for quite a while. Um, he predates me my, and uh, Andrew as well, I think, doesn't he? Yeah. No wonder he looks old. <laughs> uh, William Nevin, he's a newcomer. Welcome. And um, my understanding is that he teaches at uh, University of Alabama. Yes. And uh, he also, uh, well, we'll let you fill in the blanks with that a little more <laughs> then. <laughs> Andrew got me involved, Katech. Uh, you can tell me if I pronounced it right or not. Katech. And uh, he got me involved in Dragon Con uh, about five or six years ago now. And uh, he's always well versed on a variety of very, very controversial topics. I'm surprised he's not in Guantanamo right now. <laughs> 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 okay, well, uh, we'll just keep that in the down low. Um, we, we, we appreciate them letting him be released for this, so. Uh. Uh, sir, are you in the right room? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is this about journalism? Yes, yep. sir. Yeah. Okay. And the last guy is an uh, interesting fellow, Nathan White. I did a little research on him, and uh, I found his website, and all he has is this one single page here. And I couldn't find any more information on him. He apparently worked for this organization called the House of Representatives, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's one of the insiders, I guess. But uh, did you find that on a cached version? That website's not even <laughs> up anymore. <laughs> oh. I don't know. It says here Nathan David White at WordPress. Yeah, no, that, okay. Me, that, all right. All right. That site isn't even live anymore. Well, I, found, I found his LinkedIn <laughs> profile too, just in case. So it is me. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, yeah. And he's been extremely critical of our government, and I quote from uh, his Twitter account, Tonight our military is weaker and we are less safe because our president has hate in his heart. So with that, I'll let the panelists introduce, introduce themselves and we'll kick it off. TJ? Why is everybody looking at me? He's the interesting one. <laughs> Nathan, you start off. Uh, okay, well, uh, fill in the background. Yeah, I worked for the House of Representatives for about five years. I was a communications director er, for a member of Congress and then an oversight committee subcommittee. Uh, after that, I started a political consulting working on media issues, political issues, political campaigns, and technology issues. Uh, I'm currently the senior legislative manager at a digital rights group called Access Now. Um, I've been working with the media for over 10 years, uh, starting with chasing beat reporters in Cleveland, Ohio. And so I think one of the interesting things to talk about here uh, that I would like to get into is how the media landscape has changed over the last 10 years and how it's created this environment that allows us to have things like alternative facts that some people use without any kind of humor in their voice. They, they actually mean it. Um, I won't launch into a soliloquy and in introductions, but I'm looking forward to the conversation. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Gatech. Many of you may remember me. How many uh, regulars here? Uh, quite a few. You may remember me. I used to be the assistant director here. Now I got promoted uh, to a guest. But uh, I've spent the last 10 years working for a technology news site based in the Netherlands called uh, torrentfreak.com. I also um, contribute to Tech Dirt and a few other news sites. Um, I'm also used to be the chairman of the U.S. Pirate Party and uh, founder of the International Pirate Party Association. Uh, so I've got a bit of political side to me as well. And uh, yeah, we've, I've faced the fake news accusations and, and claims in our reporting over the years. Um, while, while 
actively reporting from everybody from torrent websites to Comcast themselves. So uh, that's 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 me. I've, I've had the practical experience. And again, I'm Will. Uh, I feel like I bring together a lot of different parts of, of this panel and different expertise. Uh, I'm here covering the con for uh, Advanced Media, uh, AL.com, the newspaper uh, site <laughs> next door in the state next door. Uh, but I'm also uh, an academic. Um, I teach at the University of Alabama, uh, JD, PhD. Um, so that's Dr. Nevin to any of my students. Um, I actually have a father of a student here today. I'm, hi again, Mr. Barnes. <laughs> um, but uh, I, have, uh, I have been a, a media practitioner for uh, many years now. And what I see today is a dual front attack, uh, both on the media as a profession. And I think that's what we hmm. might focus on today as opposed to the, the product of media, which we, I think we'll take up on Sunday with our fake news panel. Uh, who else will also be a part of that? I know I will. Uh, so yeah, so we have some overlap, and I'm sure the discussions will overlap. But uh, I think it will be interesting both today and Sunday. Yeah, I think there's also going to be a good bit of overlap with the tech dirt defamation suit, and yep. the freedom of press aspect in that as well. So uh, you're going to hear a lot about this this weekend, I think, if you come to EFF tracks regularly. Uh, my name's T.J. Myhill. Uh, as Blair said, I'm an attorney. I, I primarily work in business and intellectual property law, but I do uh, speak very often on constitutional issues, internet issues, technology issues. Technology is a large part of my practice. Um, <coughs> and uh, as, as Andrew said, or Blair, somebody, whoever called me a member of the resistance, I, I resist everything. <laughs> I am a good old, old school libertarian, which means I disagree with you no matter what your politics are. <laughs> and I am often the voice of, 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 I like to think reason, but always opposition to whatever's being said. So uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion today. All right, what is the role of the press in society? Um, you know, especially with Donald Trump in office, our dear leader, why shouldn't we just defer to his expertise? I'll just, anyone, jump in. Okay, I'll <laughs> jump in. And as, a, as a politician, at times, sort of, one I'm escaping, not in Guantanamo Bay, but uh, it's um, the, the idea of the press is to inform the public of the activities of the government and of the activities of the day in order to allow for reasoned debate and accountability of the government is, is how I see it. Uh, accountability of private individuals, accountability of public individuals. And without that, you can't have a functioning society. <coughs> That's how I see the press, anyway. I think the press. Uh, I will say soon that I think the press today is very different than the press used to be. But I will say that the press, as it should be, is often referred to as the fourth branch of government because it does provide that other measure of checks and balances. It's not the checks and balances inside the actual legislative and executive and judicial branches, but it lets the public know what's happening. And it lets us be informed of what's going on behind closed capital doors so that we can ourselves provide a check on the government by responding back to our representatives, by electing new representatives, and having the knowledge from which to make those necessary decisions. It's interesting you bring up the idea that the media uh, is a check on the government. I, I think when everything is working as it should be, the media is a check on the government because uh, people are engaged in what the media is reporting. The media is interested in being a check on the government and uh, instead of today where you have some outlets that serve to enhance the government mm -hmm. and protect the government's interests. So um, I, I like to think of just the last, I don't know, it seems like two years or three years now as a breakdown of norms uh, across many different fronts, both uh, in government and in the media. Um, the media was as an entity, as, an, as, as a profession, uh, was not prepared to cover the Trump campaign or the Trump presidency because the media functions on sort of established rules of engagement. Those rules do not change quickly or easily, and yet <laughs> so many other things have changed in politics and in society. So I, I would say 
start off my view, there's no such thing as the media anymore. Yeah. That the well, media really is, it, it, we had this idea for what the media used to be, but it's like saying, who are the people that go to Dragon Con? There's t almost 100,000 people here and everyone's different. There's dozens of different tracks, and if you follow a different track, you're going to have a different experience than somebody who follows the EFF track. The media is splintered in kind of that same kind of way where there are lots and lots of different types of media and outlets, and some that don't even really fit that norm anymore, like social media and Facebook and what you get from your, your friends' feeds. That being said, the role of media, I, I'd say there's, there's generally two. There, we have this idea that the nightly news is this public service, and it was for a while a public service that was an agreement to get access to public airwaves, that they would give us the nightly news. Uh, but other than that, the media is to make money. They don't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. Many of them work into it, and I, I work for an NGO, and I like what I do, and I do it out of the good of my heart, but I also get paid. And so that's where media gets difficult, is that it isn't really a public service. It's a business-making entity, and if it doesn't make money, it will probably fold. So if you look at what the incentive structures are for the media and for members of the media, it starts to make a little bit more sense, where if you say, I need to sell ad revenue, I need to get clicks, I need people to read what I'm saying, even if they don't read it, to click on it and read the first few paragraphs. So my incentives are to look at what people are clicking on, to look at what they're writing, reading about, and then sensationalize it. Um, that, I think, is what we're going to get into a lot with the, the Trump era and what we're seeing now. But that didn't happen overnight, and that's been occurring, I think, slowly for the last couple of decades. And as the Internet has really taken off and you know, billions of people are now on the Internet and having a voice in these social networks, it's coming to a level that we, we really don't know how to deal with and we're struggling with as a so society, and we're losing track of what facts are and what reality is. Alternative facts, I believe. Well, and, and, and that, I think, ties right into the point that I was saying we are going to get to, because I knew it was going to come up. Uh, that, 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 I think, is, is the difference between the media now mm -hmm. and the media as it should be, or you know, maybe never was, but certainly was more before we the 24-hour news has. cycle. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, when you had a half an hour of local news and a half an hour of, of, of national news on TV every night, and you certainly wanted people to watch Tom Brokaw instead of, you know, Peter Jennings, or, or, or but it was it was a way of you had a half hour to fill, and you could mm -hmm. fill it with interesting and important news, and you probably wouldn't get all the news, and you'd still go out and buy your newspaper and get a few other news items, which had plenty of ad revenue because you were only filling a certain amount of space. Now that the media news engine has become multiple, multiple stations on 24 hours a day, you've got to generate ad revenue, you've got to get those clicks. It's become entertainment. And now news is entertainment. The other aspect that technology brings in is not that access to news all day, every day, but it's the access to news that ain't news. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the, and, and, and I don't mean all bloggers or all technology news sites or things like that because there are some very very good blog there are some very very good blogs with very very insightful news art but for the most part anybody can say I'm a journalist now I can I can start a blog I can throw up a website I can have people read news from me and you're certainly going to get a a very different spin from me because I have no training or inherent obligation to tell you truthful and fact-checked news I have the incentive to tell you sensational news that I think you want to hear so that you'll come back and click my page more and I'll make more money. And unfortunately, that mentality is what has spun over into Fox and CNN and MSNBC is the idea that we've got to be more sensational with the story, make it sound like it's everything is a catastrophe so that more people will tune in and stay tuned in instead of flipping off to whatever other reality show we have on because that's what the news is now. It's another reality show. And I think that that has taken away a lot of the press credibility and has opened us up for the argument of alternative facts and fake news. It's easy to call something fake news when you can point to some fake news. You know, it's hard to get somebody to believe that, that, that I'm not giving you straight facts if everything I've told you is 100% fact-checked, verifiable, and true. 
But if you can point to something on my station that day that was a total crock of shit, and you can, because there will be, because I got it out there fast to be the first guy out, every station has that weakness, and every station can be pinged as being fake news or alternative facts. So when you, when you switch from the idea of journalism to the idea of entertainment, you lose that role of the press. Yeah, if anyone, anyone has a question, just raise your hand and we can pass you around the... Yeah, thanks. Well, I'll jump in there just to say one thing. It's, it's very easy to be down on the state of the media, with, with air <laughs> quotes, going back to what, uh, what Nathan said. But uh, sensationalism has truly been with us yeah. almost forever. Uh, the turn of the 20th century, the invention sweet, of the sweet. penny press, the New York Sun... Uh, the first successful commercial newspaper uh, figured out that, hey, if we print the crime blotter, if we focus on true crime, sensational stories, we can sell newspapers. If it bleeds, it leads. Indeed. So it, and so it's just been an evolution of that. So it's not like we're seeing a difference uh, in kind. It's just of scope and perhaps of... of Severity, maybe. So I, I agree with the professor, but I think that there's another l thing that's been happening at the same time, which has made it much worse now, and that is the volume of perspectives. That when I started ten years ago in Cleveland, there were three local TV stations, and I worked for political candidates. So it was my job to get those news stations to cover my boss. There were three of them. Each each uh, news station had three teams of three people who would go out throughout Cleveland and cover everything that was going on in the day. So I had to convince them this is one of the most important things. My, press, my boss press conference is going to be really interesting. And I was pretty good at it because there were nine total teams they needed to cover something. Mm -hmm. uh, two years later, there are still three networks, but each one had cut down to a single team and a single person who was covering everything. They were the producer, the cameraman, and the on-air talent. And when it went down to just three people who were covering the entire city, suddenly it was a lot harder to get them there. But we still only had three stations that were presenting the news, and they all knew each other. We all went to the same events. We all talked to each other. We all had off-camera conversations. So there was a narrative and a perspective about the city of Cleveland. If somebody said something that was just completely off base, it, it felt weird because it just didn't jive with everybody else, and the other two networks would, would correct them. Um, now it's completely different in that there is most, those three networks still exist but there's also a narrative that you can get from the national news you can get the cnn narrative you can get the msnbc narrative and you can get the fox narrative and the facebook narrative and now we have the facebook narrative and the twitter narrative and the uh what you see if you only follow the people that trump's fall if you the live in that world narrative. that is a a narrative that you can't really compete against because you're not saying you're saying, I reject your view of reality and replace it with my own. Only that with computers and with social networks and bubbles and stickiness factor on websites, people really do live in bubbles where everything they click through is, here is a well-documented report that looks like a long PDF and it's very serious with logos on the top that agrees with what I think. Um, and so there's always been the sens sensationalism, but now it's sensationalism plus Taylor News just for you so that you can live inside your worldview and get constant reassurance that you are right and everyone else in the world is wrong. And that's where I think you can get to alternative facts, that you may have what you believe is a fact because it fits into your worldview and it fits into my timeline a little bit different. And so I see it differently. We have a couple questions. I wanted to uh, comment on the, you mentioned the three networks in Cleveland. I'm from Cleveland too, by the way. Uh, but I'm thinking of how the local news has so much gone away. It's so much been overwhelmed by network news, mm -hmm. the networks, and then the 24-hour news cycle that, you know, Channel 3 very doesn't get very much exposure. I was wondering if you guys wanted to comment on that and how that kind of evolved. Well, uh, local news is quickly becoming the next frontier of ideological uh, broadcasting. Um, the Sin yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the Sinclair Media Group, uh, which is as right as Fox and any other uh, ideological group out there, is slowly gathering up your local news stations. Uh, I know in Alabama we have a very prominent uh, Sinclair station. Your local market probably has a prominent Sinclair station. And their coverage is dictated from the top. Explain a little bit about what Sinclair is. Uh, I think the best 
uh, description of it, uh, we, you know, nice 20 minutes is a John Oliver piece he did uh, a couple of weeks back uh, for last week tonight, and it, it covers it in far more detail than we could without taking part of the panel. So uh, that's, on, that's on YouTube. I'd, I'd recommend that if you're it's curious about it. It's a huge conglomerate, way. essentially, of conservative, it, yeah, it's, intentionally uh, policy. Has, it has most run segments that are, that are dictated by the top, by the, by the owner and the, and the corporate um, worldview that, that are sent out to states and say, you must run this. And you must run it and make it look not like an infomercial or like a political thing, but you must make it look like it's part of the news broadcast itself. And that skews the perspective and it skews the, the ideological view of the station. And, and uh, Oliver's point, or at least one of them, is the most insidious thing about Sinclair is that a lot of their news, uh, a lot of their what, what has, is dictated that those stations cover is coming from your local anchor. Uh, this is a guy that you've seen on television for 5 or 10 or 15, 20 years. This is a guy, theoretically, that you trust. So it's, it's, he's basically speaking as he was a puppet. Um, so it's, it, it can be very scary to think about and how um, other operations are, are going to mimic Sinclair, perhaps. Okay, my comment was uh, you were talking about Taylor making the site she would go to for you specifically, oh, well, this is just for you. If I download, say, like Alex Jones, okay, then, oh, well, we've got these sites just for you, so everything you click on agrees with that. If I were to download, say, a CNN, like, uh, what, Morning Joe, and, you know, because Morning Joe has something out there, oh, well, this is just for you. So it's very rare that uh, you would be on a specific website and the recommendation would have a site that would propose an alternative viewpoint. So as a person who tries to be, you know, discerning and trying to figure out what's really going on, you have to make sure that you will get a less biased perspective and they don't necessarily help you with that, oh, well, you, you know, this is for you, this is for you. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, from you guys, you keep using the term alternative facts. And I have heard that term used, misused, bastardized, et cetera, et cetera. So I would like to hear your specific definition of alternative facts, because to me, alternative facts are as, the way I see it is if there's a position here and there are facts that support it and I disagree with it, I can find facts that won't support it, and I can say, well, these are alternative facts. So what is your definition of alternative facts? Uh, I'll ask the gentleman that came in uh, a little <laughs> bit late, who I ragged on. If you would please stand up, sir. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my definition. Uh, there are opinions, certainly, and we can have differing opinions, but uh, there is a certain temperature outside that it is right now, um, and that temperature fluctuates, sure. Uh, but if we could get an exact precise measurement that is a fact um, if I lied thing. what's that That's a measurable thing. it is a measurable thing there are facts it is a certain time etc etc uh, anything else is an opinion and a misstated fact is a lie or a mistake so and there are there are certainly issues that have facts on both sides yeah. there are some and, and, and that's not an alternative fact those are facts there's a fact over here there's a fact over there and you can debate which one of those is more important to that particular issue, there can be two things that are true at the same time. But there cannot be two things that are true at the same time about the same thing. And, 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 and so, you know, an, an example of that might be, you know, if you're dealing with something like climate change, we can talk about what the temperature is outside right now. And we can talk about what the temperature used to be. And we can talk about what these various sides might have as facts to support whether there's man-made global warming, whether there's not whether there is client, you, 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 th those types of debates can be had, although I think the facts skew I, <laughs> stronger I, to one side. <laughs> but but, but the, the, there can be facts on both sides of that debate. That is a debate. So you don't call those? Those are not alternative facts. facts. Okay. Those are the other facts. Yeah. Alternative facts are if I tell you that it is December because I think it ought to be. Because my birthday's in December. Oh, this Let's is all Guinness. celebrate my birthday. <laughs> oh, this is Guinness. I mean, not look no, for it to be Guinness. that's Bud Light. My question is, is there anything that can be done? Because, you know, we have an a, a increasingly fractured nation. Um, for example, if uh, Donald Trump is impeached, 
uh, would that burst any bubbles, or would people Probably just go not. that he just got robbed? Got right. You know, yep. um, he, he was he was conspired against, and uh, it, when, once you start getting into this idea that facts are mutable and, and can be hammered into any shape you want, like it was a piece of iron, um, then you become a problem of you know, they hammered it this way and they should have hammered it that way, and the fact that they didn't is just means that they were deliberately trying to avoid that. So but is there any hope for the so future? Is there anything that can be done to help remedy the situation because uh, to, to anything that, that can make this better? Teach media literacy in schools as soon as possible, my, as early as possible. My, my 15 year old Why are you trying to indoctrinate exactly our children? Critical thinking generally. Yeah, yeah my, my 15 year old has I, started um, 10th grade uh, two weeks ago. We live in middle Georgia, and he has American government, one of those is media, and we. we walked in the parents night for it and he said watch your range of media so many students don't just focus on Breitbart and Fox News and you know we live in a very heavily Trump county and so it's a uh, he had to say that to the students because even the students at 15 or so were thinking that that was the only source of news available at the right. time. Well, and again, I mean, that's sort of the reality of the bubble, right? If Trump was impeached today, people who are in a pro-Trump bubble are going to see nothing but news about how he was robbed and, and, and mistreated and, and everything was negative. People who are in a pro-Trump bubble are going to see nothing about how we've just saved the entire known universe, or <laughs> the anti-Trump bubble. And, 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 and the, the, the truth is that it won't mean shit. I mean, we just won't have to, we won't have to read his tweets anymore. Um, you know, Mike Pence is going to take over. It's not going to change policy. It's not going to, there's no real change, but everybody's going to think that something major, major, major happened because their bubble will blow up. There is and a GoFundMe campaign, for those who don't know, to buy a controlling interest in Twitter. So they can, <laughs> ban, <laughs> they can kick him ban off. Trump. Yeah. Right, right. Which I think is awful, by the way. That I, you get a whole bunch of very left-wing people cheering on censoring media. Uh, that, that's not a good thing, but we're in yeah. this position where, we, like, we're we're on this side, and we think this, and we're like, yes, shut that guy up. He's going to blow up the world with a tweet, and he might. It's scary, uh, <laughs> but then we're putting ourselves in this position where we're actually rooting for censorship, and not only censorship from a government, but a company who has no human rights obligations or principles or authority at all to be doing it. Okay. It, it, it. Remember what I said at the beginning. I disagree with everybody. Yeah. Well, <laughs> both sides, both sides of the political aisle are completely wrong, in my opinion. But even the pirates, <laughs> <laughs> closer to right. But but the the problem you have is when you take a step against the guy you don't like, you always have to remember that it's going to be used against the guy you like next. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is more uh, inspired by what you were saying, Nathan, about how everything is kind of tied to money at the end of it. Um, what are, I'd like to hear your opinions on things like uh, the Young Turks, for example, setting this framework for things that are paid by the people um, and kind of what your opinion of their role is in what media is going to be using social media and kind of being successful doing it and making themselves more legitimate than just like a clickbait video. Yeah, so I, I don't think that there is a, a short-term fix to this. I, I think in very grandiose terms that evolutionary, our species is struggling with dealing with the internet. Used to be if you heard that there was a saber-toothed tiger, you only knew like 20 people. If you heard about it, it probably meant there was one in the neighborhood and you should be afraid. Now we hear about terrorism constantly and so it sounds scary, but it's really a low probability fact. If you're on Breitbart, they will publish every day every crime committed by an immigrant. So you think there's lots of crime by immigrants. But if you look factually, that immigrants actually commit less crime than people who are born here. Don't um, look me up on Breitbart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think the short-term solution is a really difficult one to deal with, but it's we need to change the economic model for media. that very few people are willing to pay for this kind of expensive reporting that has been done by like network news that was was doing it as a public service uh, if people are willing to get their news through Facebook and Facebook is giving money to people who are willing to click on it that's where the model is going to go that's where the incentives are going to go and the only people who are in business are going to be providing that uh, the Young Turks are, are doing great they're asking people to pony up the cash and sure that's great but that's also the model for Alex Jones 
And Alex Jones is doing pretty well for himself, and I don't know that that's great for society either. Well, well Alex Jones is mainly getting his money from selling supplements and yeah, and but other, he's and, and he's, he's monetizing and, his own what, network to give them right. what they want. You would, you, no one would buy ShamWows if nobody was listening. I mean, you got to get people to listen, so they'll buy your ShamWow. That's true. So, I mean, there's oh, in terms of breaking filter bubbles and escaping our information silos, uh, a few news producers have been experimenting with a few different things like linking to articles that disagree with them or BuzzFeed provides an outside your bubble feature in some articles now. I was wondering what you thought, what is the responsibility of news producers uh, to help people break filter bubbles and silos and what responsibility do consumers have and what tools or methods do you recommend for consumers to get outside their own bubble? Uh. I, I, I don't think there is any responsibility on any corporate entity to do anything that's not in its own best interest, and its best interest is its profits. So there's my view. The problem is that we are perpetuating, as was just said, what we are choosing to consume, what we are choosing to pay for or click on so they get ad revenue or things like that, is what generates their profits is the insular sensational, fine-tuned bubble. And so I, I don't think that it is the responsibility of the news entity to make you read better news. I think it is your responsibility to seek out news from both sides because you need to know that news is biased. Now, I, I won't say that news was ever unbiased. I, I don't think that's a true statement in the slightest. But I think that at least journalists used to try to hide their bias. They used to try to at Mostly. least provide a an, an, an non-opinionated, objective viewpoint. Every human being has a viewpoint. We all have an opinion. You can't not. Every journalist has always had an opinion, but it wasn't their role to share it. We have made it the primary role of journalism to share its bias by consuming biased journalism. And if all you do is look at the one side, then you can't fault the one side for feeding you more. You're going to keep buying it, they're going to keep making money, and that's their ultimate role. So I think we all, as people, have the responsibility to break out of our bubbles and step outside and read the alternative facts. That, this is something that I actually worry about since the, the title is Media in the Trump Era, that there's, a, there's an outrage machine going on, that people who dislike Trump and think he's absolutely awful, there has to be a fresh outrage every single day and then we kind of forget about ones that really matter. Uh, does anybody remember his children are still working in the White House? He still owns Trump Tower and is illegally making money, and there are lawsuits that are going to work their way through. That we've forgotten about that because he tweeted something stupid at 7 a.m., and we all have to talk about that for the day. Uh, so I think Is this the part where we talk about 4D chess? With that 4D chess? Yeah, it's, it's all his, his grand plan. Yeah, so one of the roles that I think is somebody needs to just be an outrage monitor for, like, hey, you know, we keep it calm most of the time, but this, this kind of is a big deal you might want to pay attention to. It's hard for me even to remember all the things that I are actually significant scandals versus just media, oh, gosh, I can't believe he's a person who said that. It's, it's sort of like the, uh, the D.C. hotel versus Kafifi. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kafifi is a huge thing. You know, people still reference it now. But how many reference the fact that he's got a uh, 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 the the hotel a couple of blocks down from the White House, which is literally in the lease from the government, says you, no government official can ho own this lease, and yet he owns the lease, and that's you know in direct violation, and he's using it to gain emoluments from foreign uh, diplomats who host events there, who rent rooms there, so they can say, yes, I'm staying at your brand new Trump hotel. So and has that's way too long for a hashtag. <laughs> Kafifi <laughs> fits right there in the hashtag. I think there's uh, one more element that I'd like to, to bring into this that we haven't got to yet, and maybe it'll help, if that we teach people that the internet is actively trying to lie to you. you we need to be skeptical of everything. In 2011, the Department of Defense issued a call and they asked the, the war contractors around DC to build a system of tools that will allow the DOD to control a sock puppet of armies. That, you know, if you hear, if you, a product is introduced and you hear nothing about it, you may or may not have an opinion. If a product is introduced and everyone in the room is like, wow, that's amazing, that's so incredible, you're gonna be, wow, that must be interesting and new, I'm gonna pay attention to it. 
These uh, command and control of sock puppet armies enable one person or 50 people to control hundreds of voices online to control what we think is an organic conversation. The DOD has been doing it since 2011, and now a lot of people are learning that Russia's gotten pretty good at it, too. Uh, I thought it was all George Soros paying it. And, and jo people. No, he George just pays Soros protesters. Be, be behind it as well. But, you know, if you go on to a social media site, like Reddit is a perfect example, and you see the top upvoted comment, that might influence what you're thinking, but it also might just be a complete lie that you should think of as being sponsored. So I, I want to bring that into the conversation of th this information, these fake news and alternative realities and different medias are actively being weaponized against us, and the U.S. is not totally too uh, free of blame here. We, we've been doing it too. Do you have a question back here? Yes. Um, so comparing like English's, England's uh, news media to the United States, yep. especially for Mr. Meehill, or I, I pronounced that right, uh, but do you think it would be better to have a government-funded news media? Oh, is, no. Is no, 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 no. There isn't no. really a government-funded news media in the UK anyway. If you're like assuming you think that the BBC, it's not actually government-funded. It's, it's a government grant that is funded by a commercially collected tax, the, the license fee, but is administrated in the, while the director <coughs> general is appointed by the government, it's not run through the government, it's not a, officially a government um, news arm, but it, it's uh, mostly independent to what's uh, called a quanga or a quasi-autonomous non-governmental organization. We also do have a, a state-run news organization. It's pretty big, the, the Board of Broadcasting Governors. It's just illegal to operate it in the United States because it's Isn't considered that like Air propaganda. America and stuff? No, Voice of America. Oh, Voice of America, that was it, yeah. A and Radio Free Asia, which actually do some pretty great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say if we had a benign philosopher king who could, <laughs> who could rule over us all, uh, it would be great uh, because we could get information from a source that we could trust and we know was accurate and was reported for the public good. Uh, my fear would be if we had a state media, um, it would change from party to party, uh, just like the FCC's enforcement priorities change from party to party. And... Uh, Oh my God! Campaigns <laughs> with a state-run media would be a nightmare. Um, in an ideal world, I like that idea, but alas, yeah, state-run media would just be Trump's Twitter feed, right? I yeah, mean, that's it what we'd get. Just repeat the the the. Um, I should I should clarify. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we're getting all these different viewpoints and that we're getting biased viewpoints. Not, and I don't mean biased in a negative way there. I mean a sided, opinionated viewpoint. What I, what I, what I don't, what I, what I regret that we don't have is a clear, unopinionated middle voice because we're not consuming that. But I think having more voices and having more information, there is never a bad thing about having more information available to you. You just have to make sure that it's good information. But that's on you. I mean, it is on you to go fact check things. It is on you to make sure that you have some information that's correct and accurate. I do wish that we, as a general consuming public, would would buy the model and therefore allow the the the, the media to have a fact checked middle view that we all knew we could trust on every single thing. But the truth is, you never have that because. There's so, always errors, so, there's always problems, there's always someone rushing to print and getting the story wrong. You've always got to fact check, even when you were back just reading the New York Times and listening to Tom Brokaw. You had to make sure that the story was still the same tomorrow. So, TJ, let me ask you this. Would you, would you support a rule that said, like Obamacare, you have, to, you have to have insurance or you get a fine, that said, we don't care what you buy, but you have to buy a subscription to some kind of media, and if you don't, we're going to tax you. But we talk about the rights of, of citizens. Is there a responsibility that we should force on citizens to actually learn about the world? Yeah, I don't, I, 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 you're going to have people that don't give a rat's ass. There are plenty of people who don't consume any news in the course of a day other than what they might inadvertently see while they're looking at cat pictures on the Internet. <laughs> and so I don't think that you should force people to consume information, especially if it's only from one penalized source. But I do think that if you are going to consume information, 
you should make it your job as an intelligent human being to consume that information from at least two sources. Hopefully one that's completely opposite you. If you're watching MSNBC all day, turn Fox on for an hour. If you're watching Fox all day, turn MSNBC on for an hour. Right? Get the other viewpoint so that you can see what both sides are saying. That's probably an actual fact. If they're not both saying the same thing, and they are, rarely are, fact check it. Make sure that you understand which one is right. Make your own opinion. Come to your own conclusions. Don't rely on being fed the story. Hi. So, um, so I you. think um, the panel agreed that the media is in financially incentivized to sensationalize things in, in the news. What really gets my attention is when there is a story that is inherently sensational, but the media downplays it. And there's, there's a few of these, and um, you could ask what their incentives are. Uh, give me an example. Okay. Um, here's an example. So um, WikiLeaks Vault 7, when it came out that the government was had tools to access endpoint devices and was using them, um, Huff Huffington Post came out with an article, and the title was Don't Panic in big letters, and then in smaller letters it said, unless you're a, a high-value CIA target. <laughs> and so that's a highly sensational story that they were downplaying with the words, don't panic. I, I, I think I might have been quoted in that article. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, probably because I was saying, don't panic. Um, okay. It, so I, I would push back, and, and this is a good reason, that it, everything is subjective. I, I work for a digital security organization, and we reacted pretty quickly to that because it originally it came, oh my gosh, this is stunning. And then we looked at what it was, and it was, okay, they have tools. I mean, it, would it, you say it's a sensational story to say that firemen have uh, axes? Like, yeah, that I mean, is a tool that they need to do their job. You, you say it was a sensational story. What made you think it was a sensational story to begin with? Was it because of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks telling you it was going to be a sensational story? Well, I think well, a lot of people suspected. They suspected, but it was but only because WikiLeaks said that they were using them this much that made you think it was so. Perhaps the sensationality yeah. was pushed up to pre to preload your expectations, and then others dropped it back down. So that's that's the other way to, to maybe look at it. Is that but, what but gave it, you the initial impact was the sensationalist. We, we we could argue that particular story, but you're, yeah. you had a larger point that I don't I don't want to get lost on in the details, and and that is that certain stories, uh, by the way they're covered, is going to influence the, what, how the reader uh, perceives it, right? Yeah, sometimes there are sensational stories that get buried despite the media's financial incentives to sensationalize everything. Yeah, and I think Breitbart would definitely agree with you. Fox News, most of their coverage is about how the mainstream media is ignoring all these inherently sensational scandal, or sensationalist scandals. Um, I, I, I think that gets to uh, what TJ was saying is like you kind of need to ignore the tone and figure out what you believe because whether you're on the left or the right, somebody's actively trying to lie to you. Let's go to the nice lady with the box. <laughs> She's been very patient. Thank you. Hi, I'm a reporter and I serve a small minority community and as such um, in our reporting on the news we've, we've really tried to educate our readers on the difference between what is news and what is editorial content. And we were making really good strides until about a year ago um, when, and it was a little bit of a, of a surprise to us, the readers, and predominantly in our, in our community, our readers are on the left. They pushed back hard that unless we were doing editorial, we were for the enemy, and there was no other line. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse to the point now where it's threats and it's actual physical violence. So that's what we're dealing with, and it's been a real surprise. So while people are talking about, and this may be with the larger media, um, dealing with it in the Trump environment and how Trump affects it, what we're seeing is the real pushback in trying to get decent news out there is surprisingly from the left. So we're wondering, where the hell are the classical liberals? Like, where'd you go? So 
you know, what are you guys seeing for the future and, and how, how does media deal with this? Because shit's getting real. Uh, well, definitely a lot to unpack there. Um, I think one strong step in trying to help the public discern news and opinion is simply labeling it. Uh, the Washington Post does this, and I think it's a very, very good start. Um, all of their news is labeled with, like, I don't know, news or something right there in the headline. All of their opinion pieces are analysis or editorial. Uh, big, bright labels that some people will be able to understand, and this is where education can maybe help fill in the gaps. Uh, in terms of what sounds like your, your readership being radicalized, um, it's, 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 it's a difficult era. Uh, I, I think you're not going to find someone with sort of a middle ground position on Donald Trump. Uh, it's either <laughs> that, uh, oh my God, uh, he's daddy, he's the greatest, or oh my God, he's a fucking piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think... It, He's the greatest piece of shit. There's some middle ground. <laughs> hey, it's putting he's, it mildly. He's the smelliest piece of shit. Um, so I, I, I don't really know what the answer to your particular problem is, and I wish I did. I wish we could all sit down at the table of brotherhood and, and figure this stuff out. But passions are just so inflamed right now, and it's, it's sad. Before, you, before we get too off, I want to try and touch on something real quick. And it's one of the, one of the issues that this panel – kind of brought to my attention uh, was that Trump's attacks on the media. Mm -hmm. I don't think that gets enough attention. And, you know, for Trump against Trump, you know, what is the role that the president should have in relation to the media? You know, how should they interact? How should they treat each other? Um, is Trump doing it the right way? Are there good things he's doing, maybe? Or is it all bad? Or, you know, I would like to hear the panel's kind of ideas so on that issue. I'd like to hear somebody say a good thing. <laughs> well, I, I know a lot of political reporters in D.C., and it, people are terrified. that There's a real belief that somebody is going to go to a journalist event and shoot it up, that people are being radicalized, they're being encouraged, there is a, a tone of violence and the same kind of thing that we're seeing around politics, that eventually somebody goes to a, a baseball diamond and shoots people, which was about half a mile from my apartment. That journalists are very, very aware of this and very afraid of it, and... I don't have a solution because we can't censor him, but we need to figure out how to be nicer to people, especially on the internet. Um, I, I think we as, uh, as a species are learning how to deal with computers and live on the internet, that generally if you sit down with somebody and you disagree with them and you're face to face and you can see their emotions, you can disagree with people even really fundamentally and still be nice to them. Where if you put a computer screen in front of you, then it's easy to just say nasty crap. And you hear everybody saying nasty crap. And so you, you create this environment. And when you go home at the end of the day, you've been working all day. You don't want to go have a civil discourse. You know, you want to go home and you want to have a beer and you want to enjoy your life. And you want to you know, look at cat videos and you want to hear people that agree with you. You want to be comfortable. The problem is our lives are becoming digital. And what we're doing online and what we're doing on Facebook and what we're doing on, on Twitter is now the social civic space. And we haven't really figured out how to be human beings in a digital environment yet. And until we do that, I think we're just going to keep being nastier to each other. I think we've just actually figured out what human so beings are. So Donald Trump's onto something, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, well here's, here, here's the other concern, though. The, 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 I mean, creating this animosity towards any group, the press or any other group, is, is, is creating that problem. But the other problem goes back to what I said at the beginning of what I would love for the press to be is that fourth check. The, what, we, what we had is the, the, the ultimate goal of the press. And you can't be the fourth check when you're not even in the room, right? When, when, you're, when, you're, closing, when you're closing the media out of your, uh, out of your briefings, mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you're refusing to allow anything to be recorded, when you're putting your announcements out you know, on your own via Twitter, it, it, it's, it's a scary thing to have a White House with Donald Trump in it or not, but to have a White House that is not allowing access to the press. And that, that in itself creates a real concern for me because, again, anything that your guy does, the next guy gets to do too. And so, you know, the next time a Democrat president comes in, everybody on the other side is going to be losing their mind that the press is locked out of the room too. But... The more we the more we deny access to the government, 
the more we weaken the ability of the press to provide us any real information, right or wrong, about what that is. We, we, we've had a long debate here about you know the, the, the skewing of journalism, but at the end of the day, at least they're still getting us the information, however opinionated it may be. But if they don't have access to the White House, if they don't have access to the Congress, what can they tell us about what's happening? We're all guessing at that point, and that's a nightmare. We have one more quick question. So, oh, wait. going back to some of the stuff that TJ had said <laughs> earlier, you know, I find where when I have uh, an issue or something's coming up, I'm having to read five or six different news sources to get the full story because you get something on the right, you get something on the left, and you get something in the middle and a little left and a little right to kind of figure it out yourself. And you know, I've only got so much time in the day. So it's hard. And then you've got the billion or so other experts on Facebook that are telling you what's right and what's wrong. So where do you think it's, I'm going to say mainstream media, the main media conglomerates out there, where do you think it's their responsibility to maybe start moving more back towards the center so we can read one article or maybe two articles and get a good understanding of the issue versus having to read six or seven articles and pull the right facts out of this one, pull the right facts out of this one, go check all this stuff on our own? Well, but who, how many people are, are sending death threats and, 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 and protest letters to their newspaper to complain that they're not middle of the road enough. I mean, it sounds like we're getting the exact opposite, you know, approach to the press. And that's that's my concern. My, my, my feeling that we're not getting that moderate, uh, unopinionated, factual viewpoint is that we as people are not demanding it. We as people are demanding that you feed what I already think. And if, if I'm only going to consume what I already think, you have no incentive but to give me more of that and f drive me even further into my box and my echo chamber. And then I'm going to demand that you make it even more what I think. And, and that's the problem we have is what I think the people are demanding, as we just heard, what, what the people are demanding is not that. And I think if we demanded that, we might get it. Yeah, but, but people are lazy. I mean, they don't want to have to spend that time. They don't want to have to change their views. They just want to say, mm -hmm. yep, that's, that's pretty much what I thought. Okay, mm -hmm. go on to the next it's, thing. It's, it's car crashes. It, it, there's traffic jams because you see a car crash. Everybody slows down yeah. because they want to look. Yeah. You do that on the Internet, and it shows, wow, everybody's really interested in this car crash. We need more car crashes. Let's provide car crashes. And suddenly I've got all this traffic looking at my car crash block. Yeah. Um, that's not a good thing. I, I, I did with, with car crashes in Britain. They've started putting screens around them just to stop. Oh, that exactly. oh I think that's a great idea. That's a great I, idea. I said that for. It's sad. It, that's, it seems inhuman, but it does seem like a good idea. Um, I, w I would say, rather than changing, I, I want to change your question and say, what is the responsibility that we put on the media? Is what responsibility do we put on you to pay for it? That if if people were actually willing to pay for it, it would exist. Uh, I w don't really like it that much, but I would say the Economist is a pretty does a pretty decent job of writing about complicated situations with pretty middle of the road so you can, you know, both left and right people like The Economist, National Journal that covers politics that uh, people in Congress actually read. Um, the problem is it's really expensive. The, the Economist is like $250 a year and National Journal is like $1,250 a year. So it's not what responsibility do we put on to other people, it's what responsibility do we put on ourselves to you know, put our money where our mouth is and say, I don't demand it to the society, I demand it because I'm willing to pay for it. Um, hi, so uh, I'm new to journalism. Um, I'm, my goal is to do hard news journalism. Um, I like local, smaller community newspapers. Um, we've talked a lot about like from the consumer side of media, and I know she talked a little bit about her experience. Um, but I guess my question, I know that um, Nathan, you talked about you know that the that ultimately the goal is to change the economic model, which makes sense ultimately. Um, but I guess my question is is as someone like who's going into journalism now, like what exactly are we supposed to do, you know, because I'm someone who, who genuinely wants to do unbiased news reporting, that's what I have an interest in, and it's really hard because either the outlets I'm interested in are going one way or the other, or, you know, the sources I'm talking to, they're, you know, either 
I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm the media and they don't want to talk to me or, you know, I'm not liberal enough. So, you know, what exactly are we supposed to do? Because, you know, I don't want to contribute to that and I, I would like to do an honest effort at good journalism. How are, how are we supposed to, to really do a good effort at that? Find an editor who doesn't like money. <laughs> <laughs> well, for six months until it goes out of business. Right. Well, no, I'm, I'm lucky with Torn Freak. My editor has a has, is really good about He's used to be a, a psychology professor, and so he doesn't care so much about the money as long as the bills are paid. He doesn't care about making lots of profit, so we get to, you know, the chance to pick the story and keep it to a the factual basis and... We, we, you know, he won't let me do any sensationalist or, or tabloid headlines, unfortunately. I can get some great puns in. Not allowed. <laughs> but, uh, well, it, it, this is the, the problem with the larger model, that the incentive structure leads you to do things as an individual that when everyone does is bad. That, it, you know, when I was on the Hill, it was kind of easy to get your boss placed because everybody you're dealing with is so busy and overwhelmed and stressed and their editors are telling them to write seven or eight articles a day that if you can give them one that's basically prepackaged that they can just make a couple calls to verify and publish, you know, you're giving them what they need to, to get, you know, the pat on the head from their editor that they get a story out. Um, the incentive structure for a journalist is to write something that will get clicks so the editor will think you're doing a good job to get more things. If you say, oh, I'm going to spend four days researching this really interesting topic that may not actually result in a story because it turns out there's no there there, um, then your editor is going to say, well, why am I paying you? It's really expensive. I've got to keep the lights on and we're about to pivot to video, um, which lots of my friends are getting put out of the job because everyone's pivoting to video because there's still money in video advertising where there's not money in any kind of other advertising. The part All hail autoplay. Yeah. Which is it's just the... I mean, it's the thing that's happening right now. It's going to die eventually as well. Uh, let, let's try to get another question or two, but let's talk. Uh, right, because it sounds like the answer so far is get a time machine and go back in time when somebody actually wanted to hire you. <laughs> Hopefully the professor will have a better answer for you later. <laughs> Any more questions out there? Uh, Last right one. Right oh, we got two. <laughs> um, to go back to the idea of state-sponsored media for a little bit. Uh, I'm a writer with the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, with research department, and I'm wondering what your thoughts would be on the role and the responsibility of communicators who are trying to act as journalists but aren't necessarily independent, who are beholden to the "Quote unquote government message." Uh, don't take this the wrong way. Uh, journalists who aren't independent are not journalists. You 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 are a, a PR practitioner of sorts, and I think PR people are fine. They do great jobs. Um, I think your work is all about being honest and transparent. That I am writing for my department. I am writing for the people who pay my salary, who are in theory the American people. Um, so that would just be uh, honesty, transparency, I think, are the big responsibilities there. All right. So um, for what comes after the Trump era in journalism is probably a little difficult to predict. But um, we talked on kind of bots. I'm curious about how you mentioned that a little bit earlier, Nathan, um, about how bots are driving the narrative in terms of news. Um, how are we going to see that structured more? Are we going to try and rein that in in journalism? Are we going to just let it go? What do we see happening there? Yeah, so uh, I, I work with an organization called uh, Access Now that uh, works on digital rights internationally, and we work with a lot of the companies on this issue because it's there are things that we can do that sound really good but have bad consequences. That when we, we talk about censorship, we usually think about the government saying, don't say this. Most censorship now is happening by, at the company level. Uh, for example, the, the Nazi website, the, the, the something Stormer, Stormfront. it got kicked off the internet because Silicon Valley got sick of them and threw them off the internet. No standards, no reason. It was just they had the power and so they could do it. So to get rid of bots, we could require you to have a driver's license and use a real Facebook ID for every website that you go to. If you had to have a real ID on Twitter, we'd get rid of bots. 
Uh, problem the is troll hunter. that also means that there would be no privacy. There would be no alt accounts. There would be no uh, infosec Taylor Swift, who's hilarious and you should follow. Um, <laughs> and for Twitter, that would be fewer Twitter accounts. Yeah. Uh, so it, I, I think that the solution there is engagement with companies so that companies have uh, public and transparent um, policies in place that really think through the impact on human rights um, and that is going to be difficult and slow because it's international and it's not just in the United States even though most of these companies are in Silicon Valley uh, but we really need to look at these these big companies as the new media a lot of people get their news from Facebook through what people post and what they share and the way people talk about it. And so we need to say, Facebook, you have a responsibility because this is the new civic forum uh, and we need to work on that. But it also needs to be transparent, value human rights. It needs to be replicable. Um, it can't be Mark Zuckerberg woke up in a bad mood and so he wanted to throw me off the internet. Uh, I do think that that's possible, but it's going to be really long and complicated and there's going to be a lot of problems we need to work through. I think, I think there's a quote from a Terry Pratchett book, which is all about setting up a news media called The Truth, and it is, a lie can get around the world while the truth is put, before the truth has got its boots on. You know, anybody can say a lie and get it out quickly. It, it takes a time for the, the, the truth to come out. And so it's something that people have got to learn that not to accept the first thing they hear, which can be, you know, anybody can make anything up about anything in seconds, but real journalism takes time. You know, uh, uh, Photoshop, you know, you can't really see any pictures on the internet anymore. Um, facial recognition is getting so good. Uh, Adobe is actually building a Photoshop that's going to be released in the next few years that can do what they do for, vi uh, audio for uh, picture rendition, for voice rendition. That you can actually edit it and hear George W. Bush or Donald Trump say anything you type into a machine. And we're just a couple years away from that being available to anybody on the internet. So we are going to be faced with these things pretty rapidly because it's going to get worse before it gets better. But it does seem possible that it will get better. I think we're about out of time, and I'd just like to thank our panelists. Help join me in thanking them. We will take it up again on Sunday. <laughs>